because as you see on my model, I try to put a model that my energy has to do with having pairs that are properly connected, and I'm going to try to go for a model where I say native pairs, okay? So that's why it became a good work. Now, so now, the next thing is, how do I, if that's the case, what do you have? You have your native state, you have a few that are similar to it, but as less than you have a large number completely different. So they go between one and zero, right? So you have these states. Now, based on what I just told you, I'm going to assume that time I don't have any major kinetic problem. That tells you that states that are kind of similar are always connected. What's not true for a polymer to start with, and I can tell you an example. If I have a protein here, and these are two helices and they are here, if I put one here, they're kind of very similar, but you cannot just cross over helices, and there are other things you can do that. Well, let's assume that's not a problem to start with. If that's not a problem, you have all these states connected this way. So now I'm in good shape. If I can find a way to design my system or select my system, this data is very dangerous to you the word design, because biology doesn't design anything, biology selects things. Right? So basically, and, and so what you have is if you're going to have a situation in such a way that the energy, of my system, my global energy is proportional to Q, that now I'm in good shape. Because I can start from any state here, I just pull down, down energy by any possible different multiple paths, they all bring me down here. If that's, so, what, so what I need for that? Because you're discussing that a lot, not only me, but I raised two situations here, all beyond that. First of all, I have an energy that favors me towards that state. But it's not like a single energy. I, I say that my energy tells you that uh, now I have a, my, the energy of my system is composed by two parts. The part that's similar to my native state. You get a, a bias that's proportional to how similar I am, and the other part is random. That's what I'm doing here. So if my system is, if you have 50% of the native contacts, 50% of those contacts, I pick up half of my it's a bit gap, and the other half is random. So it means as you can start to come down, that's how the system comes down. The way you do that in practice is the way proteins do, is by not putting stability energy in one place, but distributing as much as it can all over the protein. So the way in practice you'll be doing this is by saying every native interaction contributes the same amount. And that creates a lot of robustness, robustness in your system also because you do a couple of mutations. You might just be perturbed locally, but you keep most of the energy into your system. Right? So as you start to come down, you see the states close your native state. So if I put some fluctuations, like I told you before, in the energy here, maybe I pull this state down and this state up, but they're very, very similar. So you're just moving around that minimum of energy. Okay? So, and here, just to put you, you want to make sure that this is a big gap is much larger than that randomness that I put here on these states. So now we are in good shape to start to tell you what's the paradigm of people looking into protein form. Right? So I just brought up the problem. This is sort of a, we're setting up the message for people to go after at every single model and simulation. People are going to have to be working on that. People are going to say, oh, how rough is your landscape? You know you're talking about delta E. Why do you have activate dynamics? Why do you mean you have something that's funnel like? Why do you mean you have a stability gap? These words are all over the place. And, and like I said, you'll be here a lot about simulation, but I can tell you, and I see that we had at least one review in the situation, there's a lot of analytical work by saying, okay, these states are not totally random, states that are sort of similar to each other, they also have some correlation energy, they don't lose it. So there are lots of beautiful physics, both in the kinetics, the thermodynamics, and the glassy aspects, and how, how you go to the system to put this way. Okay? So, let's go one more slide, and then I'm going to stop and, and try to make an overview of what I have. So the, the final slide they have is, no, no, let me actually go to a different. Uh, presentation just because I forgot to put the slide here. Right? Now, 
this slide has been many different versions on, on, on protein folding, and they are just sort of a, a cartoonish view of what's coming. So first of all, that's exactly the funnel I showed you before, but I just represent the cartoonish way. Instead of drawing the picture before, I'm going, I just want you to have a look here. Instead of drawing like that, I'm going to just draw as a continuum picture, and my the width in the horizontal tells me how many states I have. Right? So that's the way these things represent. Uh, these sort of uh, traps on the side, they're just drawn on the side as, as a cartoonish way because actually that's the delta I have. They can be all over the place, right? They're just here so that you have a scale. And these things are drawing to scale. I'm going to discuss that scale for you. So if you come to a protein, let me tell you one thing. A protein normally gets about at typical room temperatures, about 1 kT of stability per amino acid. Now, this energy here for you, first of all, and, and you'll be near a little bit more, this is an effective energy. It means you're renormalizing the solvent, all the other stuff is into it. So there is entropic contribution of the solvent. This entropy here is just the configuration entropy. It's the entropy of, of the polymer, of the chain. Okay, it picks up about 1 kT of stability here. Typical traps in proteins are 2 to 3 kTs. You know these things from theory, and you know these things from beautiful experiments, you know these things from Fraunhofer on the old days, you know these things by good people doing MR. That's a typical case that's going to give you, if you put the typical number for the zero, give you the typical nanosecond time scale jumping between traps in proteins, so you can actually, all these things are consistent. What I showed you before also, is that if the protein is folding and it has a perfect funnel like I showed you before, all these things, all these pathways should be equally likely. And that tells you that it will make no difference which order you form your contents. Right? The order that you form them is absolutely relevant. That's not true in practice. And the reason for that is that someone breaks this overall symmetry against this problem. And you may end up having a few of these paths more likely than the other ones. And the question you have is what's the origin of those paths? But, but again, the concept of landscape becomes a very powerful concept here. Because these different paths, they're not like people used to think in the, in the past. You're like big canyons that you're caves and you can No, they're actually just a few cases around. You change the protein a little bit, you may go from this path to that path. And it's still the landscape is more or less the same. So the particular best not as robust as people love to say, that people used to say, if a protein now has, you form one helix and a second helix, now you do, you, you do a couple mutations, like Peter Wright has done my globe, and now you form this helix and the other helix. So now I have a different fold magnet. No, you're not about the same landscape, and you just bend the landscape one side to the other side. That's something people, but again, these are things that are being quantified now. Can you actually do these things? You have to do this work. So that's the first thing you have to do. And as we're going to discuss, dominance of path can come from two parts. One is by the fact that this, there is some randomness of that energy. You don't have every contact with the same energy, you don't have everything there, there is some randomness in there. But most of it comes from the fact that this idea of connectivity I gave to you, every connectivity is the same, is not the same. And that's what people call geometrical effects, or abuse the word called topological effects. It's not really topology the way you like to see to polish people abuse it because uh, not only geometrical because of CNN terminal, they'll discuss that, but that's the idea that comes into the situation. But now, just to finish that, if I have a, a situation like that, and I have a reaction coordinate, I can put a free energy as a function of this reaction coordinate I call here Q. Okay? And now what you see you have this free energy is is what? E minus T S. So these are at the folding temperature, the temperature where you're 50-50% occupied, you have one minimum, that's this order minimum, that's the one that's dominated by entropy, and you have the order minimum, that's the one dominated by energy. And this barrier, that we call the barrier for folding, comes from a known perfect constellation between entropy and energy. And since this barrier comes from a known perfect constellation, it's a very 
known robust factor. Actually, people into protein folding, there are beautiful experiments of people working just trying to fully remove this barrier and have what they call down, full downhill folding. And actually, you can achieve to see how fast can you fold the protein. And, and basically, these things have been done, as expected, because you just have this canceling effect, so you can actually work and try to remove that. Now, experimentally, there's something what they call five values. That's a way that people check this thing. You know what five values are? They try to tell you how much order do you have when you go over the barrier. So if you believe you have my case where all the pathways were totally equivalent, and you look how this disassemble looks like. This disassemble would be an ensemble of states where every contact would exist half of the time, 50-50. That's not true. That basically, you know, I told you, make no difference which order it would be. So you have a pathway that this part of probably for it first, I have a pathway, this one fold first, when I do a full statistics, they'll be all equally like. Each contact will be half the time order, but that's not true. You have sometimes things that are more ordered and less ordered. At that time, that's something we'll be discussing as we go along, and I, I will, I'll avoid, I'll, that's the next step to discuss order, but I want to just stop here and let people ask a few things. What you understand, and what you don't understand, and how we go from here. Do we have questions? No? <laughs> Let's go for questions. Let's go for questions. Very quiet. You had too much alcohol yesterday? Or? <laughs> yes, Bill. So all of these is for a given protein. The basic idea is that you have a defined sequence and then you are just seeing all the possible configurations to find That's correct. It. But the, the, the question we have these days, like I said, if, if, if you, if that's a good question, but let's put, put, go back. If I have one protein, the question is, how do I achieve what I ask? Basically, it's very easy to come say, it's very good if I have my energy proportional to my similarity parameter. But that's easily said and done. Right? They actually, proteins are able to achieve that to a very good degree. So there's going to be a lot of questions how they do that. So the two things you're going to be seeing on this discussion are, as you, as you see the presentations here, is twofold. First one is based that I think is the big success of energy landscape theory. That's the part that I, I in my point of view, I see a lot of the physics has been solved. You can show that based this approach explain all the data. If you assume that that's what the protein did, and you use this information, you can explain a lot of experimental data, transition data, five values, a lot of the mechanisms. But it doesn't mean that you know how the protein solved the problem. You assume that my energy is proportional to my similarity, and there are variations of it. But with this information, based on knowing the structure, and then make the assumption that the energy is, you can write the energy function that tells you that's how much that's proportional to how the state, you can explain a lot of this stuff. That's, that's one of the great success, show you that based, this is how the problems have done that. The second part that has been solved to a reasonable satisfaction, but not to a perfect satisfaction is how do the proteins do that? How do I do get to some real physical potentials? And we'll be talking about physical potential and show that this statement that I made, that that's what we need, and that's what proteins do, show that actually by using hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions and packing and all that, proteins have been able to do that. Then I let Chile explain that, but it's too hard for me. So, no, but that's, that's the second part. So it's a very interesting way when you look at protein folding, because people are actually working on both. There, there is the people that, they, that work on the structure prediction, that they say, I don't care. So let me, let, me, let me step one way. I always say, basically, what's the difference between a real web biologist, a biochemist or a structural biologist, and a physicist about what the protein folding problem is? If you get a real bench biology, they say proteins fold, therefore there's not a problem. <laughs> okay? The people that come from a structural biology and biochemistry say as long as I can find a structure, I solve the problem. 
And I don't care how we bought this structure. If you come from physics, you want to know having this structure is not enough for me. I want to know how we were able to reach this structure, what the things are in there. And more important, <coughs> what we'll be doing later in the week is to show that the landscape for folding is not different than the landscape for a function. It's the same, but that's the way that proteins are operating. So we start to, to observe things like that. So the old picture on the old view on the old view, that's a good question, just since you agree with this equation. We used to believe you had a landscape of folding, and now the protein comes to this low energy state here. And that's the functional structure. And that's not true. Proteins, are, as we are learning now, as they are functioning, they have very large excursions of breaking and forming and doing stuff like that. And they're a very interesting problem that you've done from physics. I remember writing a paper with Hans one time, People say, here's myoglobin. And myoglobin has this channel that goes to him. And this is how the oxygen goes in there. Then you do a very simple calculation. That's the following thing. You know you're not going to have vacuum. Vacuum is very costly. That means if they, there's no oxygen in there, there's water in the channel. Then you put water in the channel. And now you put the typical concentration of oxygen in blood and say, and now you figure out what's the probability of the water to move out and the oxygen to move in, and you see that it will take the age of the universe for the oxygen to go there. So you know that this channel idea that you have a rock solid channel that protein is not true. And you see actually what you have is a partial unfolding of the helix in front of the heme with a probability order 1 in 10,000, 1 in 10,000, and that's fine. If you have a heme solution, the oxygen heat is in a nanosecond. If you look at myoglobin, this time is microsecond, that's exactly the one over one, 1,000 probability of this thing opening, but that's actually something you can achieve in a microsecond. If you really, so there are very interesting things as you move into this landscape and this transition, and that's another reason why you want, and you, you, you can figure out how this protein actually breaks into pieces in this partial unfolding that you go after. So these things, actually, these functional motions, you can explain most of them. We have been doing a lot of experimentally. It's just by assuming I look at the final structure, I do a model based on the final structure, and now we can talk a lot about the mechanics behind it, even so I don't know. But the other problem is equally important. How actually proteins achieve it, right, basically? And all these things tolerate mutations, all these robustness come apart, about, and, and things like that. So that's, still, that's a very important thing to put, to put up. And uh, and then basically the real bad joke, the real bad joke you always love to make into the biophysical society. What's the difference between biophysics and biological physics? Is if you care about the answer. <laughs> and if you ask which switch, it means you're a biophysicist. So. Laboratory 
and they know those proteins fold. These are not all proteins in biology. So why I'm raising this point? This is the point is, a lot of people say, oh, but that's what happens on the cell. How about folding in vivo and vitro? First of all, let's break the problem and say, here's a sequence I put into a test tube. That's what Anderson did. Out of the cell, out of anything, and this protein is able to fold. Now, if you believe that biology ignore completely this thing, say, oh, why do I care that proteins know how to fold and so on? I want to do it myself. I'm going to complete That's not true, because that's not what happened. But in practice, it could be. But, it, but the, the first problem is a very interesting one, and, and the, that you have lots of proteins, they are able to fold on its own. The beauty of the AMC experiment is the first time, and that comes from people that come from laboratory these days, that basically they said, I can actually learn a lot about biology by looking at a biological system far from the cell environment. So what's his first experiment? His first experiment was basically to observe a protein folded, that he unfold the protein by pH, then he put back and fold again. You do that by temperature. Basically, why you cannot do that? When you basically, if you try the same experiment in typical physiological conditions, you know what happens when you fry an egg. Basically, by the time it's cooled down, you don't have the egg back into shape. Why is that? Because there's such a large concentration of protein in there that you aggregate all those cytophobic groups that you cannot come back. But you're able to dilute. So what Anderson did is say, no, I'm going to dilute so much that when I refold this protein, it has a chance to refold to do that. And if you really think, it's not the most complicated experiment of mankind, but it's a, it's a great idea. The idea that you're, you're going, and basically, he was criticized for 10 years. I had lost his biology until he got the Nobel Prize for that, but it was a it's a, it was a great, in a way, it's the way to think. You're exploring the landscape of the system. So what I'm trying to, re now I'm going, going to, I'm going to still probably going to give RNA for the end. So now what happens is the question that people want to, uh, it's needless to say that based most of the proteins that people stuck into the biophysics world and the physics world at the beginning, had to do with fully ordered proteins, because if they're fully ordered, you could actually do structural biology, you could actually see how they look like, they didn't fold, it's very hard to do structure, so it's natural that people would stay to these rock salt proteins. And, uh, and, and then if you look at them, most of these proteins, they're sort of enzyme-like proteins, where they have a very well-defined active site, they're, they have to have a well-defined order and stuff like that. So these are the proteins that we all have been working on that, right? have nice proteins like cytochrome and myoglobin, right? These are tough proteins. They can survive, even physicists, they survive in physicists' lab. They cannot be the most unstable protein, right? They're there. They, people can abuse and abuse them, and they're still there and red to give a good spectrum and things like that. Okay, so that's one way. Now, as you go to the next step, and I'm even get to membrane protein, we get to the protein the protein disorder protein. You observe, you observe <coughs> that some proteins, <coughs> and these are proteins most involved in signaling and allosteri and stuff like that. These are proteins that uh, go through very large motions and change and things like that. What you observe is basically, it's much harder to do a crystalline structure because they have all these moving domains and, and, and the art of crystallography here now is how do are you able to nail down some of these domains to actually get a structure? Doesn't mean that's the full functional structure, but give you a lot of intuition. So they are hard to say. Now, when you look at the what you call a disorder protein, and you see a lot of the signaling proteins, that may be also, these are proteins that live at, at the interface between order and disorder. I don't like the term that people use these days, intrinsically disorder protein, because that basically something is. Uh, the meaning of the word means, is first of all, what intrinsic means is a very dangerous thing. It's not well defined. What they mean is, if I look at my test tube, it's disorder. But that can be a protein that basically is there, it's just on the threshold of folding, and maybe if I bind calcium here, they just give me the additional minor stability. Now I get a structure, I have an active site on the other end, and I can start the signaling. 
So it ends to grow more and more, you're going to have proteins moving between order and disorder part for functional reasons. Now, that's true that if that's the case, sometimes disorder and disorder and repacking and reforming goes wrong. And then you have all other possible structure up here. Every aggregation and disease and things like that may come from the fact that basically the protein has to do that. So basically now if something and sometimes goes wrong and then basically or you have a machine to clean up the wrong stuff or or you form so much of the wrong stuff that you cannot control. Both of these things can bring you to diseases that you observe. So, and I think you're going to learn more and more about protein that live on this situation. And, uh, and what we, it's very, very interesting is that basically, you see that proteins that bind to DNA, they tend to have very disordered loops until they bind to DNA, and that's required. Otherwise, you don't lose it. The question you have to classify things of disorder, and I think becoming one of the real hot areas, not only in the terms of disease, but in terms of how your actual operation works. P53. As a major conformational change, one sees a different chart of DNA and is able to identify the DNA needs to be repaired. Right? So that's one, one thing to have. Now, let's look between RNA folding. That's a, sort of a, it's a new topic for us these days, but it's a very interesting topic. RNA has a major difference from proteins. Uh, proteins, the energies involved in secondary structure formation. And the energy is involved in tertiary contents. Secondary structures like forming helix or beta strands or tertiary, they are about the same. They are very similar energies. Okay? RNA, they are very, very different. The energies for forming the secondary structure are much stronger than the tertiary structure of them. So the folding of RNA is actually very different. First, you form the secondary structure, and now you search about possible different packing ways. The same way. Proteins couldn't do that because for functional reasons. They are much more compact structures. So if you had formed this sort of rock solid secondary structure, you wouldn't be able to repack them. Their RNA, even so they have structure, they are much more extended structures the way they do it. And they, they can search now how different ways they form a loop here, how different ways they can pack these things. They depend much more on the ionic strains to have magnesium and things like that can, can, can switch between the structure. They are working on rival switches. Exactly how you switch between two structures is sort of one problem. You're simulating both by using structure models and the big, big computer simulations these days. But that puts the, the RNA. But again, it becomes it basically, it becomes a very interesting question in a sense. What you're asking is basically how much the idea of this landscape we put for proteins can we just transfer RNA? It cannot, it cannot be transferred just one one. It's very, very different the landscape because here proteins. You actually form secondary structure and tertiary structure the same way. And if you look, that's sort of cool because you look the specific heat of folding and unfolding of a protein. You have just like a very sharp peak on about five degrees wide. And it's not like uh, you see secondary structure formation and tertiary. The RNA you see it both, if you start to break a switch, you see both peaks as expected. You have a very different energy scale, right? As you, you first break the weak, you never see that on proteins. But tells you it's very cooperative. All these things are sort of uh, forming together. I will be discussing that later, but that's something that actually keeps the world on perspective to go, to go about that. But I think these are very, very good questions because uh, uh, going back to the beginning, the idea of presenting the energy landscape idea for you is the idea that basically it's what I call this is not fundamental physics in a sense I'm discovering a new physics law but it's a way of what I call physics attitude. Do I have some underlying principles and some underlying theory that I should be able to encompass every protein? Although there's a big diversity in, bio in biology this diversity is just an expression <coughs> of some underlying principle and that's where you try to integrate everything. How, how often can we do in biology, or how often are we just going to be doing stem collectives? Everything is different, everything is... A, and I think you're seeing more and more in many, many problems, basically. I think in molecular biophysics, particular proteins, I think we're in a very good shape now. 
the interaction between fear and experiments is very good, but the order feels like, as we go seller by all this seems really in the beginning. But the idea of base, how a network works, base, is that deterministic, where is that noise? So, so there are lots of beautiful things that I think you're going to have a chance to see this week. But I think it's a good time to break, right? Or, you still have 10 minutes? Okay. There, good. I have one question. Let me talk about the following model. Based on the human and the marriage and the interactions. Can you comment on like long-range interactions, especially when it comes to the community? Want to talk about what kind of model? Long-range, like secondary open interactions. Instead of like marriage and the interactions. Instead of like marriage and the interactions. So basically, okay. We, we haven't told you about it, but basically, uh, every time, basically, uh, the, the typical definition is, is a little bit more uh, careful than that. So basically, uh, we'll call the tertiary interactions, by definition, those are interactions between groups that are far apart from the sequence, but become close enough in space. Right? So basically, so people call Oh, these are long-range interactions. They are not long-range in the sense we call long-range. They are long-range in the sequence space, right? They are long-range in the sequence, but spatially, when the interaction is formed, is very close. Uh, secondary structure are the ones that, like you said, they are close in sequence. When you have uh, alpha helix, that's a very easy one to call uh, to call uh, secondary structure. If, when you have a Beta strands coming together, and people are going to argue about exactly where is the threshold. That they sometimes, particularly if you have anti parallels, you may have seen they're so far apart in sequence that they still call it that, uh, you still call those things like uh, secondary structure, but they are, a bit, they are a little more problematic to put on this way. In most of the models we do, we call basically, we, we try to say that basically. Uh, secondary structures are things that you pretty much can characterize based on just the backbone properties, like the hydros and things that are local in space versus the one that you actually have to bring long things together. Now, the beauty of that is the proteins that you notice when you put energetically things. Now, if I ask you for protein, typical protein, let's get an alpha helix one that makes my life easier. Uh, and you ask uh, where most instability comes. It comes from the secondary structure. Or that comes from the tertiary structure. So let's 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 do both limits. Let's assume that basically all the secondary structure is strong ones. If that was the case, those helix will get formed very early, right? And you have all these big helix going around, and you're trying to bring these things together, and they collide with everything. You cannot do it. It's too much for you. Then you don't want to see the secondary structure to be so overwhelming over tertiary structure. Let's talk about the case where my secondary structure is very, very weak. That means you never have the helix. The helix is only formed when you have enough tertiary contact, and they, now they lock the things to the helix. That would make the search problem too overwhelming for me, because basically the, the, the protein has a big trouble figuring out is that even where the contacts are to be formed, and you would have this, it would be kinetically a nightmare for you to do. And you see that in the computer. When you make these very flop proteins in there, they take enormous amount because the computer can do whatever it wants, right? Based on biology, do, but, and you see these things become a, <coughs> a nightmare search problem. So the real situation of good folders, and you see that on the computer, and then you go to the laboratory and look what you observe experimentally and make sense is that you have these proteins where they form this, where these proteins don't really form a helix, but they have a tendency to form a helix. So they form this sort of short-lived helix and break down short, right? So basically, they, they keep flirting with the helix. And every so often, you have this, that those fluctuating helix, and then a tertiary context form locks in, and when they lock, now you lock the secondary structure. So you go through that threshold. But, so that, and that's what, basically what we learn is that when you compound these things, you observe that in proteins, the amount of stability that comes from tertiary contact and comes from secondary structure are about similar. Based as typical numbers, right? You can, you can say what it means similar 40, 60, 30, but it's, it's, it's something that basically are 
is 2 to 1 or 1 to 1, we can argue about for different proteins, but they are about typical number. That's very different from RNA, where the stability from the secondary structure is much, much larger than the stability of the tertiary complex. And the proteins need that. And if you really think about it, this is important for both things. For functional reasons, there are things that basically you, you want something to be helical in some situations, other or not, so that's what happens. Yes? Okay. From Sina's perspective, I'm curious. We started from a very basic random uh, tetrapolymer model to build up this uh, energy landscape for right? Right. But the very first assumption that we did was that we know the number of configurations. But then later, we saw that we extracted some thermodynamic coordinates that have nothing to do with, with that number of configurations. No, it, it, okay. That's a, first of all, first of all, your question is, is very well taken. <coughs> but but you have to be careful. That actually it, it has to do with the number of configurations. In a sense, let me tell you how you count. If I'm talking about configuration entropy, I have to know what's the difference between my configuration entropy from here to there. So I'll maybe I want to be cavalier about it, but let's be a little less cavalier. What really counts for me, what I call entropy as omega here, was giving myself the luxury to say that my native configuration is one. And I said that, and I will try to later to be a little more specific. When I do a problem in a lattice, I can be very specific about that. When I have a problem in a continuum model, I have to bring some level of resolution into my system, right? And based on resolution, I can define a, a delta S. So the problem is always safe in a sense that's much easier for me to start to describe something like say I have a countable number of states. Right? But in practice, that's actually you, you are going you, you're going to have to be able to define what you call a state here. And and, and now I go back to you, and I think that's why your point is much deeper than everything else. By the time you start to work your model, I don't care if simulation or theory, the level of resolution that you define what's good for you, basically. What I mean, I have a full protein. If I come here and I do a, a simple model with one bit per amino acid in the alpha carbon, where I put all the details, I'm looking at all different representations of the protein. Depending on, on which representation is satisfied, that may itself define which my order parameter reaction coordinates are. And I think we're going to go over this during the course. So I, I haven't gone on details because it's going to be actually a serious issue, but the point you're raising is a very serious issue, and that's actually a problem in biology. And now, let me tell you why this problem is even more serious. Why the protein folding became a great problem? Protein folding problem became a great problem, both for experimental editions for a long, long time, is because it was a well-defined problem. I can do contacts and competitions, I can do people predicting things. It's a well-defined problem. Basically, I define some rules of what I call what the resolution I want, and based on this rule, I can make who is able to win and lose. I can make a crystal structure, and people can come to me and say, that's my resolution, and I say, okay, and that's good or that's bad. That's a great thing, and I think it's an important thing you're going to do about it. Now, when we switch to function, after all, when you're talking about biology, you're talking about function. Uh, function is a very interesting word, because function is a word that doesn't exist in physics. Right, so now you have to say, What's my analog? What do you mean by function? Right? Basically, when you say this protein signal the other proteins, like you have a walk talk here and walk there yourself, how, 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 that actually, how that actually takes place on a physical process becomes a very interesting problem. And then the problem becomes even more interesting because now you don't have the luxury of saying, oh, I just care about this level of resolution, that level of resolution. You're going to tell, becomes a very interesting question that tells you. Which is actually information at which level is what you need to perform that function. And, and that becomes a very interesting thing on every complex level. Basically, at which point basically, do you need, what actually is, at which level of complexity of my representation of my system, I can actually talk about function and how nature works and which resolution do I need, where robustness is coming from. Then this becomes a really specific question. That's one thing I think I'll talk a little bit about it. But I think it's one of the real hot areas these days, in a sense, basically. 
at which point it's just enough to have a very good representation, which point the, the very fine details you have to come. And that changes a lot depending on which protein you have. If you have an enzyme, they have to look perfect chemical reaction, sometimes it has to be on a very precise resolution. If you have a single protein, sometimes all you need is a domain from here, move on, and so I don't think it's going to be a unique answer for that. Oh yes. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, all I said here today was to say why you have typical activate dynamics, and that's the typical relaxation. That's basically, and that's where jump between these different minima with these things here. That's what gives you on time, full time for a nanosecond. That's what put you on the typical scale that I gave you about three or five kT. That's the typical roughness of the landscape, right? So now this is a very this is a very crude number, but actually works quite well in terms of getting typical relaxation into proteins. You count that you're jumping between states on nanoseconds, you put the right number of states, you come up to do numbers that are actually very good. In such a way that, for example, if you do models where you remove the entire roughness, you can almost correct by that and relate those times. So if you can fold the protein, she can tell you she can fold the protein that's in a very smooth landscape. She takes all the rough of the landscape in, in, a, in a few nanoseconds. And but then you see that the protein actually folds you micro, uh, microseconds. That's actually a factor of one over a thousand that we're losing here. So there are lots of these, they're not precise, but there are lots of connections that goes in there. Now, that said, that's what I call typical roughness that we're doing. What becomes much more complicated that I, that I haven't touched yet? Is, is that uh, basically uh, how this relaxation process may change and depend on the degree of compactness and stuff like that. There's a lot of people work on that. And I think you, 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 you are seeing these things in these ways. Uh, we are at Protein Folding Board on Conference and people keep asking what they call that. Protein viscosity versus solvent viscosity and how you couple these two things together. Uh, there are lots of disagreement at which point you should be treating things as viscosity or you should be treating things as dominant trap, right? Because you always believe that if you, as long as you can work on here, I can always associate the viscosity and relation. But I'm talking in a statistical lab, and now you're talking between a few traps. That's taxonomic limit. That the word, but this is, we haven't gone far. But we do quite well this way. But I think you're in But this is a very, very, Hot top discussion, and if you get Hans Frankfurt today, he's going to give a one hour lecture between different between alpha and beta relaxation, and we can spend a day over that. Okay. Uh, the downhill protein folding is very good experiment to fold. Is if you have a barrier and you're looking at the situation here, most of the time, first of all, most of the time, you spend on one minimum or the other minimum, and you don't get the interesting stage, that's which are the steps you go through towards fold. Also become much slower. You believe that you do downhill folding, means you, you work on this protein in such a way that this barrier is removed. And if this barrier is removed, then the dynamics of folding will be just like the protein moving uniformly towards that folded state. And people are observing that with doing try to do some single model and other things. And and uh, and that's sort of very, very cute for two reasons. First of all, you learn how fast you can actually fold a protein. And uh, so this this became very important in a sense that the theory came very early on and say the reason proteins fold slow is just the fact that, that you have this bear and things like that. There's nothing that uh, cannot make them fold faster. And now you have reasonably large proteins folding on a microsecond time scale. And that's what people are learning, that's sort of the time limit you can fold. That's the time it takes a typical polymer to just collapse into that size and fold. So that's, that, that's what's, what's very important into the sort of relaxation process that Elisa was asking. The question is, you can really fold the protein in a sense on this sort of 
collapse relaxation time. And that's, and that's where removing barriers become very important. The other thing that became very important, this was something people said from theory, that these barriers were not a robust part of these things, and you could actually, in a very similar landscape, do that. So this fact you can re really redo these things by experiments, demonstrate that based all those ideas were not so out of control, because you can actually get these proteins. Now, I'm going to tell a little bit more about experiments in the other two lectures, because I think that's very important, but that's, that's where downhill folding became another thing. The, the final thing is that basically, if you can really have lots of these proteins folding on microsecond time scales and have enough experimental data that with barrier-less situation, that's really the interface between large simulations and experiments. Basically, I think the large simulations people are now pushing from nanoseconds to microseconds. Right? And the experiments are getting the microseconds. So if, you, if I can, in a simulation basically, if I'm going to put a thousand nodes in Los Alamos to run folding like you have done sometimes, you don't want you to spend 99.9999% uh, of my time on that minimum and provide me with no information. So in a sense, it's basically, if you can have a system where actually I can actually get useful things this way. And why is that? Most of the work that people do on simulation these days, but by the way, and you're going to be telling about simulations, most of the high power simulation when people say they fold a protein in a computer like we did. We didn't fold them kinetically. We use some uh, cheating sampling technique to go over the entire system to do. Basically, there's no real system where people have been able to actually kinetically fold and actually see if you can do it. And that's an interesting question per se. And that's sort of what a downhill fold, that's what people are really looking for, a real downhill folder where you, you believe you could really bring this interface together. I don't think that's that's uh, something that's going to change our understanding of protein folding, but at least may demonstrate, should I believe on the force fields we have now, or really we have to put some quantum corrections into this force field? These sort of classical balls and springs are not good enough. So that, these are interesting questions. And you're going to find people on both sides, on both sides of the camp. And the reason, and all these questions, when you have disagreements like that, it's because these are not qualitative questions, these are quantitative questions. And when they put it, then mean that someone has to quantify and write an equation and mean, if you say a force field is good enough, you're going to have to, to put a number of what good means. Right? And that's the, the stage we're right, we're right now in. particularly self-assemblies of proteins, and I'll leave uh, directed assemblies of proteins more for the lectures by Alex McGillner later in the week. Uh, protein protein interactions and, and protein DNA interactions. And my plan um, is basically, in this lecture, to talk about this alternative, which we've already discussed some, about how proteins can find order, not by folding at the monomer level, but rather by aggregation. Um, and to talk about self-assembly versus regulated assembly a little bit. Some observations uh, that drive the whole study of this field, uh, plaques, fibrils, and cross beta structure, and uh, a little bit uh, potentially about amyloid protein functionality for the prion protein and others, and specifically also to give you some argument about how um, uh, one can understand very slow time scales from kinetics in the case of at least a couple of the proteins that are known to self-assemble in amyloid uh, formation. And, uh, then tomorrow, I'll talk about uh, more details of the sort of organizing principles as Jose laid out very clearly and as I discussed with ICAM, ICAM is very concerned with the organizing principles of matter. And so to talk about the organizing principles uh, behind the structure of amyloid matter and also a little bit what is known at least about potential organizing principles for how amyloid matter can be toxic. Um, the means of study of, of amyloid matter and uh, amyloid functionality in nature and, and out. Um, and then uh, 
On, third, on Wednesday, I'll talk about some things, uh, sort of a little bit of a grab bag, but I'll talk some about uh, protein DNA interactions and protein protein interactions, uh, finding binding sites on DNA and the, the role of cooperativity in gene regulation, uh, which again depends sort of on protein assemblies, uh, protein regulation and interaction networks, and why uh, scale free networks are it seems to be of interest in biological systems, why that is biological systems seem to have selected them. Um, okay, so uh, what we're talking about when I talk about self-assembled protein matter is uh, a kind of a new phase of matter, which, is, which are these, these amyloid assemblies. And this is your mind on amyloid, if you will. This is a, a plaque from the brain of somebody who had Alzheimer's disease, a plaque from the brain of somebody who had Parkinson's disease, <coughs> plaque from Huntington's disease, a plaque from uh, one of the human prion diseases, Kuru, the disease of ritual cannibalism um, of the 4 tribe in New Guinea, that led to uh, an understanding of that led to a Nobel Prize for Krupp and Gadgetsek. Um, and fatality in these diseases is correlated with the existence of these plaques. And when you purify these plaques, you can isolate that these plaques are uh, dominated by uh, proteins, they should be a little bit careful. In the case of Huntington's and Parkinson's, they're called the inclusion bodies. For the prion and Alzheimer's, the plaques exist outside the nerve cells. For these, you, you find inclusion bodies within the nerve cells. They're not limited to just neurodegenerative diseases. There's about 40 of these amyloid diseases known now, probably more on the way. Uh, some of them uh, don't cause nerve damage, but you just accumulate large amounts of amyloid in your body, and that causes your organs to fail. Uh, so uh, these these Fibrils, when you disentangle them, are made out, sorry, these plaques, when you disentangle them, are made out of fibrils. And the fibrils are really one dimensional protein crystals, which under electron microscopy, for example, of beta 42, look like this. Their size scale is about 10 nanometers. They have remarkable properties. They're very regular. Um, they have a lot of tensile strength. Fibrils have been used to template nanowires, to self assemble gold and silver nanowires on them. Um, and this is an image from a, a collaborative study between the Dobson and Sable groups in England of some synthetic fibrils, not made from any amyloid disease, but uh, uh, just in the test tube. And these actually are like hollow nanotubes. Um, the interesting thing that will come up again and again is that the one thing in common between these fibrils is that they have cross beta structure. You see beta sheet structure which runs perpendicular to the one dimensional axis of, the, of this one dimensional protein crystal. I'll say a little bit more about that later. But the idea that they have to be sort of hollow protein nanotubes, that's not true generically. There could be other possible motifs out there. OK. Um, like I mentioned, actually, I should change this number to, to about 40 known diseases. Uh, one thing that's interesting in all these diseases that's already been alluded to in some of the discussion, particularly between Gerson and Jose, is that we, we basically know the proteins that are involved in all these diseases. We know the beta-42 protein and the tau protein that are involved in Alzheimer's, alpha synuclein, Huntington. There's actually nine other diseases with a very similar characteristic to uh, Huntington's that I'll tell you about more in a minute. Uh, the familial form of Lou Gehrig disease, a myotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis, uh, uh, involves mutations in superoxide dismutase. Um, uh, type 2 diabetes, um, immunoglobin light change and the, the prion diseases. It also it turns out that in all these diseases, almost all these diseases, we don't know what the, the nominal biological function of the protein is. Even it turns out here because when this particular superoxide dismutase was knocked out of mice, there was no damage caused to the mice. So what the functionality of it is is, is not entirely clear. Um, so it's an interesting problem, but one thing we do know is that in most of these proteins there are either complete stretches or large stretches that do not fold at the monomer level, that they remain disordered at the monomer level. So they're not, they're counterexamples, if you will, to, to, the, to the folding model that Jose presented earlier. Uh, it's also interesting to note that some of these diseases have a heritable component. In the case of Alzheimer's, about 25% of the known diseases are um, inherited. For Huntington's, it's 100%. For prions, it's about 10 to 15%. Prions are alone among all diseases in the ability to happen spontaneously. Most of the prion cases are spontaneous uh, by a family mutations, by a genetic history, about 10 to 15 percent, or by infection, as you well know from mad cow disease and from the Kuru disease uh, of the animal in the beginning. Uh, they also tend to be diseases of aging. 
That's not necessarily true for type 2 diabetes, for example. Uh, that's not necessarily true, but they tend to be diseases of aging. And one of the questions you can ask as a physicist, who doesn't know much biology, which is the way I got into this field, is if they're just diseases of aging, could they be due to intrinsically slow kinetics? In which case, physics has a chance to say something about them. That may not tell you about the toxicity mechanism, but it may tell you about the time scale by which you wind up getting to a place where these diseases can be toxic. So uh, I've highlighted Huntington's. I'll talk quite a bit about Huntington's and prions because those are the two cases that have proved most amenable to kind of uh, biological physics or biophysical study. I'm not sure I know the answer to this question, so I, I'm not going to, uh, uh, you know, the, I'll do the Fifth Amendment. I won't answer the question <laughs> about the, the, the answer. Okay. Um, and so this is just showing you, for example, the prion protein. Uh, Kurt Vujic's lab in the 1990s, using nuclear magnetic resonance techniques, worked out the structure of the ordinary form of the prion protein. The prion protein takes two forms. It can take this, this normal cellular form, called PRPC, or it can take the uh, anomalous scrapeus form, for which the structure is not yet fully known at a high resolution level, at the level of one to two angstroms. What I want to point out about the prion protein is this, that the well-known structure is out here, where you see this red circle, that's where actually there's strong biochemical and uh, biophysical evidence that that's where the infectious uh, and, and disease-causing structure lives. And notice that most of this is actually nominally random structure. In fact, in the NMR experiments, they cut it off at residue 121 out of 230 because they basically can't resolve any uh, structure out there. So the normal form of the prion protein is, is soluble in water, and that allows you to do uh, uh, NMR, solution NMR studies. Unfortunately, the infectious form precipitates out of water, so you can't do solution NMR. You can't crystallize it. You can take uh, fibrous rods and try to do x-ray scattering to get some generic features off of it. And you can do electron microscopy. But one of the big problems for most of these proteins, particularly for the larger ones, is that you simply can't do high-resolution crystallography work. Now, that's a problem. But it also is an opportunity for people doing at least theoretical modeling, because you can help to guide the experiment. So again, what seems to happen is uh, that you get order by aggregation, get order by assembly of the proteins rather than order at the monomer level, as with the protein folding problem. Um, nevertheless, there are some selection principles operative that we'll talk about tomorrow. There are some selection principles operative that will tell you whether you favor this uh, this formation of the self-assembled amyloid structure or not. If you're wondering what amyloid is, by the way, amyloid just means it stains like starch. Uh, and it goes back to the 1800s. So it's a bit of a misnomer, but the same dyes that could be used to stain starch can be used to stain these fibrous structures of proteins. So that's all that amyloid means. OK. Um, what about the cross beta structure? This is from a very nice paper uh, uh, in the uh, Luis uh, Serpellon collaborators that showed up about 10 years ago. Uh, these are uh, fiber x-ray diffraction patterns. So they're bundles of fibrils of amyloids. There are eight different amyloid diseases represented here. What you can see in common on these x-ray diffraction images is these, these rings right here. And these rings right here with the, the vertical orientation with greater intensity, as you can see in these little subsections right here. These rings right here with, great, with the vertical orientation of the fiber going this way uh, correspond to this cross beta structure. That is, they correspond to basic diffraction peaks at plus or minus 2, two pi over C, where C is about 4.8 to 5 angstroms. And you, if you ask what the spacing is between beta strands, whether it's parallel or anti parallel beta strands, the spacing between beta strands is 4.8 to 5 angstroms. That, that alone makes it pretty interesting. It suggests that there's a lot of beta structure uh, present in these proteins. And you'll see this kind of thing in any one of these amyloids that you, that you look at. Uh, now, uh, Pauling actually discussed, as he did discuss many things, Pauling discussed cross beta structure back in the early 1950s. You also get corroborative evidence if you look at um, um, circular dichroism and FTIR. For example, this is from a paper uh, in Chris Dobson's lab from about eight years ago. Um, so what they did here was they took insulin, the protein that, of course, is involved in um, um, you know, diabetes, or the lack thereof is involved in diabetes. So they were able to make insulin under conditions of low pH uh, 
form amyloid fibrils. And so uh, what they do is they go to low pH and heat things up. When they start out, the insulin has, for example, a circular dichroism signal, which measures the rotatory power of the light passing through the protein. A circular dichroism structure, which um, is in the alpha helical uh, minimum, right here, near 200 uh, nanometers. And it shifts as you heat it up over a period of time. It shifts to a beta structure, which is indicated by this minimum near closer to 220. You can also see a change in the FTIR. So that's Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. You shine light and measure the absorption uh, by vibrational excitations inside the material. The vibrational spectrum, if you have mostly alpha helical character, looks different than the vibrational spectrum if you have mostly beta character. And again, you can see the crossover from alpha helical to beta character as a function of time at this particular amide uh, vibration band near 1650 wave numbers. And it's not just that you see it with these uh, proxy images from the different spectroscopies. You can also do electron microscopy. And as you heat the stuff up, you start to see these fibrils form inside the material. You can visually see them. So there's all kinds of uh, cross experimental cross correlations which show you that a common feature in these, in these proteins that will form these amyloid fibrils, a common feature is that they have this cross beta structure. And they therefore have an enhanced beta content over uh, uh, anything else. In the case of this uh, insulin, they were actually able to convert from alpha to beta by going to extreme conditions. Now, one of the interesting things, and I'll just back up a slide or two here. One of the interesting questions then is, is this the generic tendency of proteins? That is, if you leave proteins at a, uh, sufficiently high concentrations, is the generic tendency not to fold as they do at the monomer level, as evolution is selected for? But is the generic tendency to aggregate? Uh, and the answer, uh, many people think, is, is probably yes. Um, so let's see, why would you find the beta structure so useful for aggregation? It's fairly simple, really, compared to alpha structure. If you have alpha structure, um, you know, you have a helix like this, where you have these hydrogen bonds forming locally 